I love my job as a podcast editor. I get to listen to podcasts every day and get paid for it. And my clients are absolutely wonderful, as many podcasters often are. One of my clients, Catherine, is the producer for Solo Travel Talk with Astrid Clements of AstridTravel.com. Every episode I listen to, I find out about travel destinations that all end up going on my bucket list. But when I edited a particular episode, answering questions about today's topic as it pertains to different parts of the world, I was fascinated to find out that it was more than what I assumed was a way of saying thank you to a restaurant server. You're listening to The Story Behind, The Extraordinary History of the Ordinary. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind tipping. But first, a quick message. Thank you to the Podcast Brunch Club, which is doing a giveaway of the story behind book. The winner will be chosen December 20th, 2018. And if you're looking to find other podcast listeners in your area, I invite you to check out podcastbrunchclub.com to see if there's a chapter near you. If there isn't a chapter, they have all the resources you need to start your own. And really, starting a chapter is as easy as writing an email once a month, picking a place to have brunch, and listening to some podcasts. The theme for December's Podcast Brunch Club, by the way, is binge listening to the podcast Last Scene, about the largest unsolved art heist in history. So I can't wait to listen. Find out more by going to podcastbrunchclub.com. Like me, you may have learned TIP stands for to ensure promptness, but that origin is actually unsubstantiated. It could also possibly come from 17th century slang among thieves, meaning to give. That slang actually makes a lot of sense when you think about TIP in the sense of a particular piece of information you would give to someone, like a hot tip for a reporter. It's not actually clear where the word came from, but as almost clickbaity headlines will have you believe, Tipping actually has a dark and sordid past. From the tipping episode of Solo Travel Talk, I learned that not everywhere in the world has tipping. In fact, in many countries, it's downright insulting to leave money on the table after you've dined, and the servers might chase you down to return the money. But in the United States, it's fairly common and often a necessary compliment to their wages. But how it began was much different from what we think of as a simple gesture of gratitude. While it's not as common anymore in Europe, that's where many historians say tipping began, in the Middle Ages, between a lord and a serf. But it wasn't necessarily seen as a way of thanking the serf for a job well done. It was more seen as a master showing his dominance over the serf, or giving them a taste of some riches to keep them working harder to maybe gain enough favor to garner more tips. It carried on for years, and it was seen as a way to denote inferiority to the recipient. Basically, it was a way to make sure people knew which class you belonged to. Following the Civil War in the United States, during the Reconstruction era and the passing of the amendment to abolish slavery, former slaves found themselves without work or room and board. Many of them took up sharecropping in order to stay on their former master's land with a small portion of the crop in exchange for tending the rest of the crop. But many took on jobs seen as common, like barbers, servants, houseboys, and waiters. Following the Civil War, Americans were traveling to Europe more frequently, and many came back with the European custom of tipping, possibly under the assumption that it was something the sophisticated Europeans did. Some saw the tipping tradition as excessive and redundant, but it also meant that former slaves taking these positions that were seen as menial could work for less since they would probably make up the rest of the money they would have earned through tips. This was especially prevalent in restaurants and railway construction. Even though it seemed like an easy way for those hiring former slaves to keep their wages low and their profits higher, by 1915, six states had tip bans in place. However, they were often difficult to enforce. Iowa, in particular, actually imposed a fine for those receiving the tip, not even the one giving the tip. Much like Europe in the Middle Ages, it was also seen as a way to enforce a class system, but Americans tended to overdo it, according to Europeans. When Americans, who had already become accustomed to tipping, went to Europe, they would overtip, leaving native Europeans to complain that they were being outdone by the flashy Americans. But all the same, there was a divide between those who tipped because they wanted to assert their superiority and those who were completely against tipping. And even then, there was a deeper divide between those who didn't tip because they thought it was pompous for those trying to emulate Europeans 
and those who didn't tip because they thought that that was beneath them to pay a courtesy to someone they saw as inferior. By the 1920s, the anti-tipping regulations were abolished, and tipping became common practice, although the trend was slowly dying in some European countries. But many working for low wages counted on tips. Newspaper carriers, in particular, would include a piece of paper in their year-end delivery, insisting on tips. These were either placed in by the newsboy himself as a way to compensate for the newsboy's meager earnings. Now, there are plenty of online blog posts with tipping guides for the holidays, in case you want to know what the customary tip is for, say, your delivery person. And since reading those, I now feel bad that we're practically on a first-name basis with our UPS driver because of how often we order from Amazon, and we've never thought to tip him. In 1938, the first minimum wage law was passed in the United States, but it allowed states to set a lower rate for those who were regularly tipped. By the 1960s, there was a regulated minimum wage specifically for tipped workers, much lower than the federal minimum wage. But many restaurant workers are now fighting back against this regulation and tipping custom in general. Not necessarily because of the dark past behind it, but because all but six states have a lower minimum wage just for those who make tips. And while the rumor floating around is a server can make up to $100,000 a year because of tips, When actually investigated, that was the exception rather than the rule. There are arguments on either side of this debate, including the idea that if restaurant workers were paid the federal minimum wage and not tipped, restaurants would actually be able to make the same amount of money, if not more, than they're making by offering the tipped minimum wage. But as I like to end my episodes on a happier note, there are plenty of stories of generous tips that I can only imagine were given with the best of intentions and one of my favorite 80s movies was based on one such tip. I'm of course talking about It Could Happen to You, starring Bridget Fonda, Nicolas Cage, and the amazing Rosie Perez. I'll try not to spoil the movie too much if you haven't seen it, but the story it was based on was that a police detective who frequented a pizza place offered to split the winnings of a lottery ticket with the waitress who worked there six nights a week, if he won. A few days later, she received a call saying that they would be splitting his winnings of $6 million. So yay! The episode of Solo Travel Talk that inspired this episode will be linked in the show notes. And you can find that as well as so many wonderful travel tips over at astridtravel.com. Information for this episode was sourced from Time, the Asterisk Today, the Washington Post, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This week on Trivia Tuesday in the Story Behind Discussion Group on Facebook... Jeffrey said, although headquartered in Dallas, Texas, the convenience store chain 7-Eleven has been a Japanese-owned company since 1991. John posted he learned that the first female combat pilot was Sabiha Gochin. She flew 32 combat missions for the Turkish military. Another fun fact about her, she died on her birthday. If you'd like to talk about trivia you pick up during the week and have it read on the show, join the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook. This episode was brought to you by the story behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind and who also get access to the full scripts of these episodes before they go live. And a big thank you to Aliquity who just upped her monthly Patreon pledge. So she's seeing the very early beginnings of a new project I'm working on exclusively for Patreon supporters at $5 a month or more. The full list of executive producers can be found at thestorybehindpodcast.com slash executive producers. Thanks for listening.